right now, right now, right now. January 31st, 97, since the day I left my mother's room. I've known exactly what I gotta do. Before I start, I just want to thank Hardwood Amino for supporting this video. As I've started to grow my channel over the past two years on YouTube, Hardwood Amino has undoubtedly been one of the biggest center points for a lot of my growth on the platform. If you don't know what Hardwood Amino is, it's basically a forum where like-minded basketball fans congregate and talk about everything NBA and basketball related. If there's something you want to know, or just discuss and it's about basketball, it's probably already on Hardwood. You can participate in quizzes, vote in polls, join and create your own chat rooms and threads, or just keep up to date with everything going on in the league and around the world in basketball, if that's more your thing. I'll leave a download link for you all in the description if you're interested, where you can find me there too. I'm pretty active on Hardwood and reply to all my DMs, so feel free to come through and just say hi. Now back to the video. There are only a handful of players who have come into the league that can boast the achievement of having a fundamental rule change in the NBA because of the way they played, be it for the better or even just for the worse. Shaq, Will Chamberlain, and Reggie Miller are just three of the names that come to mind when thinking about players who have literally changed the way the game of basketball is played, at least in the NBA for that matter. Will Chamberlain was the first player to enact real change in the NBA. Seeing the league widen the lane from 12 to 16 feet, as well as introducing offensive goaltending and interference because of his playstyle. Reggie Miller made kicking your leg out to draw contact on a shot illegal, after gaining a notorious affinity for doing so in the 1990s. And Shaq? Well Shaq has had at least 4-5 to five different things changed in the league, ranging from changing the materials backboards are made out of, to changing how zone defense was played, and being the sole reason for the league introducing the 3 second rule in the lane. But the player I'm going to be talking about today, didn't necessarily change any sort of fundamental rules pertaining to the way the game of basketball is played in the NBA. Instead what Spencer Haywood did for basketball in the 1970s would completely change how future prospects could even enter the NBA forever. Even though it sounds cliche, before I tell you how and what Spencer Haywood changed in the NBA, you first need to understand his background and how his and his family struggle early on in life was a motivating factor for pushing so heavily for this rule change in the NBA. Spencer Haywood was born on the 22nd of April 1949 to parents Eunice and John Haywood, a blue collar couple with a family of 10 children living out of small town Silver City, Mississippi, which was at the time one of the poorest counties in all of America. And from the get go, it seemed as if Spencer was dealt a pretty rough hand in life, as just three weeks after Spencer was born, his father would tragically pass away leaving his mother Eunice to solely look after and raise the family of 10 children all by herself. Eunice quickly found work where she could, picking cotton for $2 a day on a local farm in Mississippi, where Spencer, the three month prematurely born baby at the time, would accompany her day in and day out as an infant in those fields. And by the time he was four years old, Spencer himself was working in the cotton fields as an extra means of income to support his already struggling family earning also just $2 a day, working from sun up to sundown. Despite this now being highly illegal and of course morally unjust, Spencer actually credits these days working in the cotton fields with his family to being the real foundation of his early basketball skills, saying he developed great hand-eye coordination and strong legs from the constant and repetitive picking of cotton. And although from an early age, Spencer did appear to have the potential to be a great youth basketball player, his family just didn't have the financial means to be able to afford an actual basketball or a hoop. But with a bit of ingenuity and craftiness from his mother Eunice, Spencer and his siblings now had a basketball to play around with, handmade out of a potato sack and old rags. Even though Spencer himself said quote, it didn't bounce, it did resemble a basketball enough that Spencer was able to hone his skills and practice whenever he could. So by the time he was 13 years old, Spencer had shot up well above the average height for a kid his age, towering at an insane 6'6 six six and instantly being recruited to the school basketball team on his first day of high school at McNair High. He would only stay in Mississippi one more year before saving up enough money to move in with some relatives in Detroit after his sophomore year. This move to Detroit also saw a new and improved Spencer Haywood emerge at Pershing High School where he almost single-handedly led the school to the Michigan Class State Championship in 1967. Spencer's success in basketball wouldn't remain exclusive to just the high school level though, as while attending Trinidad State Junior College in Colorado during the 1967-68 season, 
Haywood would record a nearly unbelievable 28.2 point, 22.1 rebound stat line for the season, earning himself a spot on the 1968 USA Basketball Olympic roster in the process. Now while professionals such as NBA players were not allowed to officially play on Olympic basketball rosters until 1992, when the now infamous Dream Team made basketball history in assembling one of the greatest basketball teams to ever exist, Spencer Haywood's Olympic performance should still be seen as something commendable, leading all of the USA men's team in scoring with 16.1 points and setting a USA Basketball Olympic field goal percentage record of 0.719% from the field. Haywood would transfer to the University of Detroit in the fall later that year, where he would do more of the same, averaging 32.1 points per game and leading all of the NCAA in rebounding with 21.5 per game. Just out of this world numbers, even for college. Now while Spencer had the option to stay another two years at the University of Detroit and finish the standard four years in college a player would usually do at the time, the numbers he was putting up were just too dominant to stay in college. But it was the apparent racial tension among the University of Detroit team that would really justify his decision to declare for the draft. There was only one problem with this though. The NBA, which was at the time the dominant league between itself and the smaller ABA, had a rule stating that any player deciding to declare themselves eligible for the NBA draft must first wait until the college class that they would be in had graduated. The NBA argued that the influx of young players would destroy the league, and that the siphoning of talent from college basketball teams would destroy college basketball, and simultaneously ruin the talent pool of the NBA. But the truth was this rule was put in place solely in the best interest of both the NBA and certainly the NCAA. It just wasn't in the best interest of the players themselves. Even Spencer himself knew this at the time, infamously saying, most colleges, including the University of Detroit, were doing their damnedest to see their basketball players did not get an education in anything more academic than square dancing, and now they were worried about our educations? So with that in mind, and the fact that the ABA was a much more welcoming league at the time, he was drafted to the then Denver Rockets in the 1969-1970 season. And what Spencer did in his first year in the ABA, at the very least, had to be leaving NBA owners thinking twice about the validity of the four-year rule in the modern NBA, as Spencer tore through the ABA, putting up a ridiculous 30-point, 20-rebound stat line for the season. While these numbers may be slightly inflated, due to the level of competition obviously not being at the same caliber as the NBA was, people still saw the potential Haywood had and realized he really belonged in the NBA, leaving owners across the NBA wreathing about the potential flurry of players with Spencer's skill level that could be lost to the rivaling ABA, all because of an otherwise archaic and honestly unnecessary rule the NBA insisted on upholding. At least this was the case for the Seattle Supersonics owner at the time, Sam Shulman, who completely disobeyed the ruling of the NBA's four-year rule and actually signed Spencer Haywood to the roster following his 1969 ABA rookie season. This bold move by the Supersonics GM was met with undeniable scrutiny as you'd expect. Not only because he was going against the rules of the NBA, but considering the lingering racial climate that still existed in pockets of America at the time, and some players, fans, and even owners still not being acclimated to having an integrated league, it gave the unsavory sorts more ammunition to oppose with what Spencer and the Supersonics were doing for the league. The NBA wouldn't go down without a fight though, and in retaliation to this perceived mutiny, the league invalidated the $1.5 million contract Spencer had signed with Seattle and moved to have Haywood blocked from playing in any games for the Supersonics that season, ending up with Haywood only playing 33 games for the entire season. And many of those 33 games in which he did play, he was either booed, taunted, and even on some occasions, spit on and called racial slurs when facing teams on the road. Despite this adversity Spencer faced, and what seemed like to him, the whole world coming for him, he didn't buckle. In fact, it was probably these hard times he faced during this whole ordeal that strengthened Haywood's resolve to make a change. And paired with owner Sam Shulman and the entire Supersonics franchise by his side, the group filed an antitrust lawsuit against the NBA claiming that the league's threatened penalties against him and Shulman for not following draft rules violated antitrust laws. Essentially antitrust the laws that were set in place in America to prevent market monopolies like John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil in the 1900s from completely eliminating competitors entering a market of trade, which encourages competition, inevitably benefiting consumers in the long run. 
Haywood and Shulman used these antitrust laws to claim the NBA draft policy was a restraint on trade and that the NBA infringed on Haywood's rights to make a living via the four-year rule, therefore being illegal in accordance with the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. While some people argued that Spencer should have just waited until June later that year to apply for the NBA draft when he would have been eligible, instead of riling up the league and supposedly causing all this trouble for himself. In his defense, one of the driving factors behind Spencer's push to force the NBA to lower its restrictions on player eligibility was so Spencer would be able to earn an NBA salary and provide for his family, particularly his mother, who was still picking cotton for $2 a bag in Mississippi during this lawsuit. Spencer and Supersonics owner Sam Shulman faced many legal hurdles while trying to fight against the NBA and win this case. Going through boundless court proceedings, legal maneuverings, and injunctions. All the while Haywood was fighting to even participate in games during his rookie season in the league. And to the surprise of himself and many others, the lawsuit he filed against the NBA picked up enough traction among the legal system to be referred to the highest tier in the United States legal hierarchy, the Supreme Court. And in 1971, over a year after Spencer and Sam Shulman had initially filed the antitrust lawsuit against the NBA, the Supreme Court voted 7-2 in favour of Haywood, stating the four-year rule was, in fact, infringing on Spencer's right to making a living. And thus he was reinstated his full $1.5 million contract and was allowed to freely play in the NBA without any fear of repercussions from the league. Even after a win of that magnitude, having literally and figuratively had his day in court and won, some owners, fans, and even players still held animosity towards Spencer, conceivably for what they thought was making a big deal out of nothing. But after Kareem Abdul-Jabbar showed solidarity to Haywood by meeting mid-court and giving him a big bear hug during a game of the two opposing teams in 1971, a lot of that animosity that had been held towards Haywood died down. People understood the clout Kareem had as an activist and as a player, and in turn respected Spencer and what he had done for the league afterwards as a byproduct of this interaction. Although this altercation between Spencer, the NBA, and the Supreme Court, from what I can see, is still not that well known through players and fans alike, the effects of what transpired in 1970 and 1971 still has long-lasting effects on the league to this very day. Contrary to the 1970s, nowadays it's almost unheard for college players to stay all four years at the collegiate level. And players like Kevin Garnett, Tracy McGrady, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, and any other NBA player who entered the NBA on a one and done deal, all have Spencer Haywood to thank for being able to reap the benefits of what he fought for in 1970, by being able to provide for their families and play professional basketball at an earlier age than what would have been previously possible. Had these events not transpired the way it did, who knows if this rule would still be in place today or not. But I'm sure I speak for all fans and NBA players in particular when I say, I'm glad it's not. And as always, thanks for watching.